He's so nice. Not at all like what I imagined. We gave you everything. We gave you your name. What have you done with it? But the sentiment, the idea, it's so basic. You feel like you already know it, you just haven't thought of it lately. You know what? I have good ideas. Oh, bring you back some literature. <laughs> you handle the words. You know how much we want you here with us. Welcome to Mad Men, men. We've been talking about Mad Men, the show, for a few weeks now. And we are now on episode, which episode is this? Five? Or no, four. It's four. I was about to say, it's not been that long. Yeah, we're on four. Fourth episode of Mad Men, and it's called New Amsterdam. I am John Groney. Over here, we have Will Ashton himself. Hey, Will. Hey. Hey, man. It's been so long since we talked, like a day. Sure. And then, peeping from outside our bathroom... Is that Michael Overholz? It sure is. Hey, Michael. Hi. That must be a, a new record for how fast you were wrong on the pod. Uh, <laughs> how fast I was wrong. <laughs> Wait, what did I do? Oh, yeah, because episode five. <laughs> I'm sure I'll break it <laughs> next week. Um, yeah. I, I have been told by people with opinions that New Amsterdam is the first, like, A-grade Mad Men episode. Like, people regard it as one of the best of the season. And like the first episode of the show that's sort of like of the highest quality that the show gets to, you know, every, you know, every few episodes a season, people are like, yeah, there's usually like four or five episodes every season that are like at the top of its game. I'm sure that's debatable. I'm excited, though, because I love this episode as well. And I think it's really well done. Really excited to get into it. But uh, I got to ask Will, because reminders of people, you know, to anybody who watches the show or is watching with us, Will, this is your your second time watching the first season, but it was many, many yes. years ago, right? How much of this episode did you remember? Um, I remember not a lot from the first half, but I remember surprisingly a decent bit about the second half. Um, I really remembered uh, Cooper's office. Is it Cooper? The, the mm-hmm. boss boss? Yeah. Bert I remember Cooper. that... I remember that very well. I remember them taking their shoes off. I remember the like just the layout of his office really well. I remember that scene. Like as soon as it started, I was like, oh yeah, I remember how the scene plays out. And subsequently I remembered the scene after that with Pete really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are the main things I remembered about this episode. Though it's interesting that um this episode in your uh wind up you were saying that this one was so highly regarded because I felt like the second half of this episode is really, really strong. But I was not as taken by the first half of this episode. Really? I was curious if that was something that you guys felt. I mean, my general overview is I I think the whole thing is solid the whole way through. I, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's a quality difference myself, but, you know, not like you think, I guess a quality difference is more like I feel like the second half is just stronger than the first. Well, much yeah. like Bethlehem Steel, I felt like the first half of the episode really laid the backbone for where sure. the rest mm. of the episode went. Well said. Gotta say, it's probably my favorite episode we've seen thus far. Yeah, like I said, I I think it's a good, really good episode. It has some uh, one of my favorites, uh, Don pitches, um, kind of in the show, uh, if only because it's one of the most unique ones. It's one of the ones, one of the few times Don kind of just squirms a bit. But all right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, Mike, you said that you wanted to start with a question that gets brought up at the end of the episode, right? So uh, something ha- having to do with drinking because we're we're all drinking here. Yeah, you know they're sitting in the office and and what is sure. was it? I always fuck it up, Roger. Uh, what does he say? Is your generation like, they drink yeah, for the wrong your reasons? Yeah, yeah. You don't know how to drink. Um, and he mentioned something about like an imaginary wound, right? Mm-hmm. I forget which person actually said it. I have to bring up the episode myself. But uh, we're we're of the same generation, technically, right? Well, I think Mike, are you Gen Z? Or are you like one of the younger millennials? I'm a I'm like right on the cusp. I feel like if I was born mm-hmm. two years earlier, I would have been Z. But yeah, I'm a millennial. I'm a '95 baby. You're like a zillennial. I guess. I don't know. Um, You're just you, man. Yeah. I don't do like, I don't really play Fortnite. So maybe that can help classify me. Oh, you might get kicked out. I'll have to cut that out in post production. <laughs> Sorry. I love Fortnite. Yeah. Yeah. You love uh, teabagging your bros. Uh, Will, you and I are firmly millennials, huh? Like right in the middle, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'm younger than you, but older than Mike. I was yeah, born. You're, you're younger by like a few years, not a lot. Yeah. I was born old. like on the later or you're born in a little early. town of Bethlehem. Sure. Um, I was born like not on the cusp, but like on the later end of it, depending mm-hmm. on where you cut 
off the millennial thing. But yeah, I am in the millennial bracket, no matter how you look at it. I feel like millennials, we drink to forget that climate change is a thing. I think it's pretty fair. That's my answer. Yeah, I guess. Calm down, a- Adam McKay. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Don't look up. Um, I, I think we drink because it tastes good. I think we're just like uh, Roger Sterling's generation. Wow. You think so? We're the World War II generation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've been through I mean, just we lived as much in war as World War II. Actually, more war mm. than they went through. I guess he was technically in it. But, like, we all saw 9-11 on the TV. Yeah, I mean, I guess we we had our own, re- like, the recession, depression. There's a little bit of uh, congruity. Congru- I don't know, I think I'm saying that right. Um, sure, fair enough. Uh, I mean, it's it's always a truth, right? In the, in the episode when he mentions how, like, you know, people in the Bible were probably saying, talking about kids today. I think that's always fair. Generational think, differences aside. The, I mean, I, I was mostly joking when I was talking about why do we drink. But I also thought that that was so, like, it's such a, uh advantage the show has to be able to be in the future, obviously, um, but be a set piece in the 50s because they can speak to these 60s. times. You 60s, were wrong 60s, about something. Me. Yeah. Oh, you were, you were ready for that last week. You were yeah. you were ready for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like eating my licorice. It's not going to stop me. I just think it's such an advantage that Mad Men has, though, to be something that takes place in the thousands, uh, have a set piece in the '60s, but get to have these conversations about time and generation um, that has an impact no matter like who you are, how old you are. Um, it's, it's such a strong point of the show. I think this is definitely one of those shows. Like it always like fascinates me that it, this first season was made in 2007 because to me it's so timeless I, I can't put a year to it um it's just so well shot composed structured everything across the board but yeah uh will did you have anything to add before we start digging into the episode proper um about you what drink, you've been will? saying or just in general what was that uh, i want to know why you drink oh i decided to drink whiskey this time since this episode is a very whiskey friendly episode mm. of Mad Men. That's a clutch way so, to deflect the question. It is. But the question was, why do you drink? Not what? Oh, why do I drink? Oh, yeah, uh, I, I was like, like oh, what no. am I drinking? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, I like why do I book. drink? I don't know. I mean, it's something that has been conditioned into me by society at large and something sure. I ultimately enjoy doing on occasion and responsibly, hopefully. So it's All less right. an addiction and more Pavlovian. I, like uh, I guess so. Yeah. If you want to look at it psychologically. I do it pretty sparingly. Like I know some people who drink like every day or almost every day and I couldn't like it to me, it's got to be like an occasion, like, you know, doing it like once a week is usually too much for me, but I enjoy it. Like it's always something that I, I'm not like a sad kind of, I guess, uh, Mike, you've seen me when I've had more than a few, huh? Um, You're an antagonistic like drunk. I am. Oh I yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you you just trap people into movie opinions. You know you're going to bully them about. No, that's me when I'm sober. Mike. <laughs> well, I guess it gets worse when you drink. <laughs> yeah, I I thought I, I thought I was better, but you know what? I'm not as self aware as I should be. Probably the uh, I think the first time I saw John drink was when he was on my podcast, Saint Ogre Totes Ogre, and he went on a five minute rant about his experience seeing Shrek in the Swamp karaoke dance party on a plane <laughs> after nine eleven. <laughs> I think that's the highlight of our podcast. <laughs> Did you see that? Uh, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Al Pacino's phone case is a bunch of yeah, tricks. Yeah, yeah, no. Believe I sent me, that yeah. to Will, and he was just like, "Yes, yeah, like ten people already sent me that." I think, <laughs> I, sent it to you. I think I just, I think I just didn't respond to it because like so many people have sent it to me. Oh no, no I just numb. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, wait. I I, I told you about because uh, I actually saw that phone case photo. While I was rewatching uh, Shrek Two for this, yeah, you had a moment, uh, huh? Met a month moment. episode, and the guy who sent it to me was watching it with his roommate. And his roommate is was also watching, and he was also watching uh, Shrek Two because that roommate was going to be on our episode. So it was just a weird kind of serendipitous moment where that happened. This is our long way of promoting Will's other podcast that he does. Sure. It ain't ogre till it's ogre. And now in its yeah. final season. So yep. And if you're keeping Wherever notes at you home, listen to podcasts. That's three segments, a different podcast uh, drop, and we're about <laughs> 12 minutes in. Still no Mad Men Men episode. We're into. not, yeah, we're not as well structured as Mad Men. Matthew oh, Weiner and the team. Uh, this, by the way, was directed by Tim Hunter, who I think is one of the best directors uh, the show ever had. But go ahead. Um, no, I was going to say that speaking of Mad Men Men, uh, I was talking to my roommate 
and he uh, he knows that I'm watching Mad Men for this podcast. And today was the first day he asked, "What is the name of this podcast that you're going to do?" And I said, "Oh, it's going to be called Mad Men Men." And he paused. Said, "That's a terrible title for a podcast." And so I wanted to make sure that you knew that, and I was on the air. Huh? I'm sorry he doesn't approve. And I told him my idea, which was it's a Mad 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 Men podcast, and he seemed to like that one more. So too long. What does your roommate think about Mad Max Fury Road? That's how I base his opinion on our he name. Seems to like it. I mean, we haven't. Yep. I don't fuck think this guy. About it too in depth. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. I'll let him know you feel this way. All right. So let's start New Amsterdam from the top. The episode opens up with a recording of Bob Newhart, the co- the comedian who used to be accountant and accountant, as we are told. Uh, this is actually the first episode I think that opens in Sterling Cooper. Like right in the office, there's no interlude, there's no like Don on the train or anything like that. We're, we're right in the office and we're in Pete Campbell's office right away. You know that we're in for a different kind of episode, right? Because up until this episode, we've really mainly focused on Don and Peggy, mainly Don. I mean, Peggy's barely been in the show the last two episodes. Um, but yeah, in this episode, this is the Pete Campbell hour, I want to say. And this uh, this moment kind of starts us off. The, the guys are kind of hanging out in his office. They're all buds. Uh, you know, we get this little moment where Harry Crane obviously doesn't understand Lenny Bruce, which is kind of funny. Like he doesn't think Lenny Bruce is funny, which I, I took a bit of an affront to because Lenny Bruce is like one of the greatest comedians of all time. No disrespect to Bob Newhart. Um, not, I wasn't sure. Like I didn't read too much into the Bob Newhart thing. Like I, maybe I don't know enough about the comedian, but in terms of like the general themes of this episode, I just found it to sort of be like maybe emblematic of Pete being in his office, kind of like being juvenile, kind of being like a kid. And well, there's a lot of stuff in this episode about adults being kiddy, kiddish. I mean, they make a point to say that he was an accountant first and he became a Oh, yeah, comedian. there's a whole thing. Yeah, he, like he wasn't, and he didn't have like a yeah. creative job. Pete kind of finds himself wanting to be more right. creative. Yeah, and I thought That's that good. was kind of, I yeah. thought that was supposed to be like a mirror for like how Pete indirectly was kind of trying to see himself as like a Bob Newhart, like overstepping, kind of like becoming something that he's not. And so that's that's why I took away from that. All right. That's pretty fair. Look at that. OK, uh, we meet Trudy. Trudy comes out and uh, played by Allison Brie, who at the time, I think she had only been on one TV role before this. Uh, I don't remember what it was. Uh, this was still a couple a couple years before she would be on Community, like her big role. And it's actually pretty nice how Community, like the people on Community were such big fans of Mad Men. They would say in like later interviews, like in the later years of the show, like, yeah, we, we were really flexible with the Mad Men showrunners to have Allison Brie kind of do both shows because she's in mm-hmm. a lot of episodes of Mad Men. And this is the first one. She is here. And uh, what do we think of Trudy, Mike? Well, Allison Brie's my celebrity crush. So mm. I, and I think I think it started with what Mad is this, it started with Trudy. Yeah, mm. no, it still is. You know, Dave Franco, very lucky man. We met him outside a, a screening of uh, of uh, movie in Palo Alto. But anyways, uh, wait, what movie oh. was that? Wasn't dis- yeah, what movie was it? Was it Disaster Riders? It was Hateful Eight. It wasn't. It wasn't even his movie. A screening. It was uh, when oh, he, he- they did the limited run of film, and it was Christmas Eve. This. Yep, and mm-hmm. me and uh, Maverick went. And mm-hmm. uh, there's two showings, and the whole Franco family, obviously famously from Palo Alto, were in the first yeah. showing. That's cool. But yeah, right. anyways, Trudy is uh, is interesting. I think she's a, a really great juxtaposition. Not you only can give her a baby. Yeah, she's a great juxtaposition, not just to uh, Pete, but also to to Peggy. Um, and it just gets better and better with every episode. But yeah, I love her. I love her. Yeah, it's like with Trudy, you, you meet her and you kind of wonder. You know, maybe some people were watching, not me, but like because we all know Pete Campbell sucks. But we're all probably wondering, you know, thinking that Trudy deserves better. But you might be thinking, is like, oh, maybe he's miserable with Trudy. That's why he steps out on her with Peggy. Then you meet her, and she's just like literally the idyllic wife, you know, in all appearance. You know, extremely patient with him and loving, spontaneous, fun, also independent. And Pete Campbell, he, there's even a part, uh, I think, in the episode where like, Don's just like, yeah, you're a lucky guy. <laughs> like kind of saying it's like, yeah, you're kind of uh, out of your league a little bit. But yeah, not much to say here. So they, they move on. Oh, yeah. Trudy kind of meets Don. She's like, he's so nice. Not at all how I pictured him. All right. Also wanted to point out, it is amazing how this episode starts versus how it ends. I want to get back to that. So Trudy takes Pete to an, an expensive apartment, $30,000 to buy this apartment. To be fair, 1,500 square feet is a big apartment. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, it's like 30000 is probably the rent for a month. Exactly. <laughs> mm, like that. Uh, I, I really love, like, Trudy, I know you're not good at math. But that, 
I make $75 a week. <laughs> That's $3,500 a year. And it's just like so condescending. I, I, and you kind of expect her to just be like, dude, like, you know, kind of be like, what the heck? And no, she's like super chill about it, right? Yeah, I think it goes back to even what we were talking about last week of like women having the power in the relationships in this day and age, but not through actually having the power, but playing the societal norms. She just, you know, weighs it off like, ha ha ha. Yeah, well, it's not we don't, we can just get alone. Like, obviously, she's already thought about it. Like, mm-hmm. Trudy already knows she's going to get this apartment. She clearly has grown up being daddy's little girl, getting everything that she wants. Uh, and so she clearly already has a plan. Well, that's the thing. Pete has two, right? He grew up super privileged. Like this episode makes clear. Like he comes from a more like conservative, austere family, I guess. But yeah, it is it is worth kind of pointing out his like reticence to the whole thing. What, what was your read, Will? Yeah, I mean that was one of my bigger takeaways watching the episode. Is it was surprising to learn why Pete was so frugal when like you learn that his family is not only lo- loaded, but like they have so much power in in terms of the New York at the time. So it was just, yeah, it it is an interesting juxtaposition of two people who are very much uh, privileged and grew up in privileged households and find themselves with sort of opposite views of how they should spend their money or how they should acquire money uh, and all that. I mean, clearly, you know, there's a lot of pride with uh, Pete as far as, um, you know, like he does try to uh, talk to his parents about it, but they're just not having it. Don't really see him as respectable or worthy of respect, even because he's just not at a place in his life, I guess, where they deem him worthy of it if he ever will be. And yeah, it's uh, it's almost enough to make you feel a little bad for Pete. Almost. Almost. So we go back to Sterling Cooper. We do get a little bit of Don in this episode. He has a run in with Rachel Mankin, who now has Paul Kinsey on her account. Uh, you know, he's perfect for Minkins. Um, yeah, okay. We all we all know who you wish. You know, she even says it's like we both know how we'd like it to be. Um, it's so weird how this show like kind of makes you root for these two, even though it's terrible. Like she needs to get out of that whole like thing. And she rejects Don. Don's kind of like, hey, you know, like you know, maybe we can go get some lunch. And I just love how she shuts him down. She's like, I really can't see a reason for that. Gets out of there. She's an independent woman. I mean, and it just makes Don want her more. She put him. In the doghouse. Ooh, that's a good callback to the last episode. It took me yes, a second. There you go. I was like, mm, yeah. yes. It's a little it's a little scene, right? And I was kind of like, I wonder what the purpose of this scene is. Is it just sort of like putting in like a little beat here, going to come up? Because she doesn't come back up. Rachel is never mentioned again in the episode. But re-watching the episode, I do think it is going to come up. It's going to sort of uh, get an idea across of like Don's headspace. Uh, but we'll get to that. So we move to later that night. Betty is reading some dumb, lame, stupid story to her dumb, lame, stupid kids who want to hear it again for some dumb, stupid reason. Terrible. Uh, Sally wants to see her dad. Us too. I was so ready for this to to be done with. Um, I'm just being a little mean, but um, I don't know. That book sounded horrible. Um, But yeah, Sally's just kind of like, you know, where's dad, you know, and everything. And then we cut to the morning after and Betty is walking Polly Doggy, uh, one of the best characters in the show early and you know just a nice little carryover from how you know this is don's fault that they she now has to walk a dog at like 6 a.m and he doesn't have to yeah um and she sees that helen bishop's ex-husband is banging on the door to get in he asks to use her phone but she says she doesn't let strange men into her home which is ironic considering who she's married to um and, and you know i was kind of thinking about this like was he trying to see his kids when it wasn't like his like time to do so like outside of his custody and i was thinking like is betty sort of wondering about what, you know how this man is so like he wants to see his kids so bad meanwhile don is never around you know not seeing his kids not doing anything not really giving a shit uh what do you what do you think mike i didn't read it that way i feel like betty still um maybe subconsciously she's thinking that but it didn't really play out that way in the episode maybe we see that later but i think betty's still so stuck in societal norms that all she could think of is like like this poor woman what a poor situation i can't imagine this this is scary like um just all the other all the judgments that the that the neighborhood wives have of 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 Helen Bishop just coming even you know closer to the surface see i kind of i sort of disagree i think it's more of like she wants to be Helen Bishop but she also resents Helen Bishop for like breaking the social norms of the neighborhood not really that she like i don't think she feels bad for her at all like I think she she tells herself that she does, but it's more of like, who is this, you know, uh, what's the word, kind of hellion, you know, who's just sort of like shaking everything up, 
defying, breaking the social rules. Why can't? I, and she doesn't understand that she wants to do that too. Uh, I mean, what thing I did find interesting about the scene is that um, similar to the scene where she's driving with uh, her kids and she crashes the car into was it like a fire hydrant or a tree? Uh, like somebody's front yard. Yeah. Uh, or like a like a, a fountain, yeah, that's right. Um, it's interesting that like Betty is often perceived as this sort of like idyllic housewife, like always doing over uh, Dawn and the kids. But obviously, as the show is progressing, we're seeing that she has more inner turmoil. And outside of like the scene where she's the scenes where she's going to therapy or um, you know getting drunk at that um, like uh, work dinner thing, uh, and I think episode two. Um, Every time we've seen Betty outside of the house, she's in like some moment of danger or something where it's like everything is like sort of placid and ideal. But like, you know, like the first time we see her outside of the house, she crashed the car. Second time she's in this moment of danger where nothing directly terrible happens, but there is clear threat and she finds herself in a vulnerable situation. I find that to be kind of an intriguing thing that I felt was worth discussing. Definitely intriguing. Definitely. Um, so later in the day, related to all this... Oh, I forgot. I was going to say, the one creative decision that I did find very bizarre from Matthew Weiner is that after mm-hmm. the scene, this fairly tense scene happens, uh, they cut away to uh, uh, Kevin James on a Segway. And <laughs> I'm like, this is a fairly bizarre scene. And it shows clips from the, the motion picture Paul Blart Mall Cop, which wouldn't come out for another couple years, followed by the sequel for Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, which also would not come out for a few more years after that. And I'm like, this is very bizarre. I don't know why Matthew Weiner put this in, but of course that proved to be an ad for IMDb TV, which, I mean, uh, you know, just just a very bizarre choice, I think, creatively. I know how you guys felt that's, about it. That's for listeners watching along with IMDb TV. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't see that because I, I have it on iTunes, but uh, yeah, I guess that's good for me, I guess. So later in the day, Helen Bishop, she drops by, she apologized to Betty. She's so embarrassed for the, for the drama, drama, and, and more drama. Betty says, oh, what, what are you talking about? And Helen is like, bitch, yes, you do. <laughs> like, LMAO. Like, and, you know, she's like, I saw you at the window, catches Betty. And Betty's just sort of like, clearly, she doesn't want to talk about it. I think the whole thing makes her uncomfortable. And Helen's just sort of like, you know, he's not a bad guy. And she kind of mentions like, you know, when we were married, you know, he never even wanted to see his kids. Now he like can't get enough of them. And she just mentions like the irony of that, like wanting what you can't have. And she also kind of makes a joke about life insurance and him dying and her getting money. And it's funny how she kind of has to be like, I'm joking, (laughs) you know, because this is such a literal person. I think she sees that like Betty isn't, doesn't have a good sense of humor. So she, you can sort of tell that she's like, all right, I kind of have to, I think Helen senses that Betty is like a kid, you know, in in an adult's body, um, which is weird considering what happens later in the show or this episode. Um, We find out that Helen's husband had been cheating on her. We all kind of assumed that um, she's also a fox and uh, just a wonder work of a human being as an actor. She's just, I love Helen Bishop in this show. I know we talked about it last time. And uh, yeah, I also think that this this moment is sort of underlying how Betty probably is suspecting that Don is the same way um, as this guy. And speaking of, he drops by, awkwardly says hello. And Betty says this whole thing is like, he has to go right upstairs and have complete quiet for a while. And it's just like, that's how Sally would say it. And it's like, they're really laying it on thick, almost to a fault. Like, do you really have to like uh, infantilize Betty this much? Or do you guys think it's like, doing the job of the episode i think it has to be done i think uh i think some people are just not as as smart as you john and so it takes uh, the <laughs> three extra beats that you don't like for you know not, the rest of us wrong to go all the time oh okay i get it she a kid very nice very nice i don't know i don't know what do you think will um i mean i think that kind of gets into why i feel the first half of this episode is maybe not as strong as the second because I feel like there is a lot of stuff like this where they lay it on thick. Also, like at the beginning, I feel like the nostalgia stuff is laid thicker than it is in some of the other previous episodes. Like I felt the last three episodes were better about incorporating the 50 stuff outside of maybe the pilot, which was to be expected, but like certainly like with the new heart stuff. And there's another example that's uh, eluding me, but I just, oh, uh, like the Kennedy thing. Um, you know, just stuff like from the 50s and 60s, I felt it was a little bit more laid into the episode in a way that felt a little bit grating to me mm. uh, compared Ooh. to the previous episodes. But if you didn't like um, Kennedy, you're going to hate the penultimate episode of the season. 
No, I mean, it's not that I dislike Kenny. Uh, I just felt, and that just, I don't know, that one, maybe not the best example. Big I just felt like, supporter for uh, her, her all 12, wrong ones. Damn. When we talk like, about yeah, the episode, like, which more, president feel, do you think? <laughs> there's a, there was another example in this episode, but I just can't think of what it is off the top of my head. That it was really uh, 60s? Probably, yeah. I just, I don't know. I When we talk about the episode more, I'm sure it'll come to mind, but okay. I just remember like the New Heart stuff felt a little clunky to me in this episode in a way that I felt like this, the oh, callbacks nice. or, the, or the references to other, I get like, it's like we said, like I think for the uh, comparison point, the Pete it's fitting. It's not like off or anything. I just felt like it was not as uh, seamless as I guess I felt like other episodes have been about the uh, references and callbacks to the periods of uh, the time period as uh, yeah. One uh one side note about this episode that I really appreciate too is that you know the last episode we got the whole the bombshell right that Don has another identity that this person calls him Dick Whitman and I think in other shows like we'd get more progression out of that in this episode but we don't like this episode is sort of just like it almost like a, I think people would call it filler but it's not it's kind of like um I was reading a a recap of this once and somebody likened it to being like a short story kind of show and I had that same thought when I was watching Sopranos for the first time, because Sopranos is kind of like that, right? Well, where you're watching it and a lot of these episodes, like a lot of them don't build off of the one previous, like a bunch of them do. Sure. And Mad Men is like that at times, but you can take a lot of Sopranos episodes and just hold them on their own as like short stories, like in this world. And you just sure. have like things happening to the characters. And the fun is like seeing them react. Whereas a lot of shows we watch these days are more serialized. It's like, you're watching like an ongoing story, you know, one thing happens after the other, you you get more progression, like a movie instead. Well, yeah, I mean, well, certainly, I mean, th- there's no denying. I mean, like Matthew Weiner wrote for Sopranos. Uh, every episode of the show thus far has been shot by Phil Abraham, who is the main DP for the Sopranos. I mean, a lot of the, the, the heavy hitters involved with Sopranos were also involved with the show. So it is, you know, uh, a sister show, I'd like to think, to Sopranos and, and that line of thinking with television. So I don't think that's incidental. Also, the, you're mentioning a very different than what we would get today. I think it's also just pre the age of streaming, right? So all the all, all the shows yeah. that you mentioned, or the idea that you mentioned, John, of you know sh- episodes building on top of one, one another, they're also released all the same way, all, yeah, all, yeah. all the same time, um, where this was a, uh, a non, you know, come out once a week with seasons. Um, and it's just so good. Like you, you get the Dick Whitman and then you're like, all right, you want to learn more about him? Nope. Here is Pete Campbell. <laughs> oh, but if we're doing Pete, then I guess you're going to get a lot of Peggy, right? Nope. She doesn't have a single Betty. line. <laughs> she smirked right. at him. Yeah. We're very well said. Very well said. So we cut to Pete's house, uh, his parents' house, otherwise known as hell. And he's sitting on a cloth covered couch, obviously. And his dad is trying to make rich white guy small talk, which is fun. And, you know, he takes an easy shot at advertising. He clearly does not respect the job. He at one point likens it to like whoring around, basically. Uh, he literally says like, no job for a white man. Um, like, okay, dude. Like, we do, like I, that was another moment. like really laying it on thick that you're not supposed to like this guy, you know. Uh, Pete, for some reason, tries to defend his profession, which I feel like at that point, dude, it's just like, you're, it's a losing battle, but I guess he is trying to like work himself up to, you know, asking for money. That's why he's there. But the thing is, he's a very small person. And, you know, I mentioned before, Tim Hunter directed this episode. And one of the things I love about the way he directs it is that Pete is just always so small in every scene everybody is like overshadowing him his own mother like when she comes into the frame is like hovering over the guy he's kind of sinking in bad posture in his couch and even when he tries to like adjust himself to be bigger like everybody in the frame is still larger than him and it's just such a subtle but you know effective touch to make it clear that like he's small and he feels small and he knows it and all of that uh he brings up the apartment 83rd and park very nice but it falls off after 79th, uh, quite a quote. Uh, Pete squirms asking for help with the down payment. And his father just kind of like swiftly, without even thinking about it, is like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Doesn't give a reason or an explanation. Um, Pete even has brings up like as a guilt trip, you know, how they covered up for apparently his brother like hit somebody with his bike, which is just like absolute yikes. Um, but yeah, his dad is sort of like, it's not about the money, Peter. You know that. And... 
you know, Pete, Pete's kind of like, well, why is it so hard for you people to give me anything? And here comes one of the best lines of the first season. I think it's uh, one of the, probably the, my favorite Pete Campbell moment uh, in this episode and one of the best in the season. But he says, uh, you know, we we gave you everything. We gave you your name. What have you done with it? And I think it's it's one of the most important and sympathetic moments for Pete Campbell for the rest of the series going forward. I think it like captures who he is and why he's important to this show. And uh, Vincent Kartizer, his his whole like reaction to it, it's all gold. So yeah, I love the scene. Great scene. Yeah, it really drives home like the and like an overall Mad Men theme of like the power of a name. Um, you know, I think it plays out differently for Don and Dick respectively, but, um, also love what you said about him just being small in every shot. I, I thought that same thing, but for the next scene, when you get to him in the apartment and he's, the dude is just drowning in this shirt. That's like comically like a pirate wouldn't even wear this with its baggy sleeves. Like, um, but yeah, just seeing Pete. So, uh, emasculated, it, it, emasculated. Absolutely. With his parents, but then how his mom was hovering over him. But then the second he said something about his brother, what she got up and left. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, walking on eggshells for that family. <laughs> like I said, total hell. Uh, any thoughts, Will? Uh, I mean, you kind of addressed it already, but one thing that really always stands out to me about this show is just uh, how good the set design and art direction of the show is. You mentioned just like, I, I love the touch of the fact that the whole room is like, sterile and cold in a way where it feels like there's going to be like a murder happening <laughs> like yeah. it's a, like you feel like you're like going to watch the death of Pete Campbell because like there's like white cloths all over all the it's the such furniture. old money and his dad is wearing shorts right it's just yeah. so indicative yeah yeah and it just like oh it just reminds me of like 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 Cooper's office like I said before I love the way that looks how bizarre it is how much it stands out compared to the rest uh, Sterling Cooper's uh, The Office, and um, also just like I mean, even the house for um, uh, what's the name of Betty's neighbor, her friend, mm. um, Francine. Francine. Uh, when we later see her house, I just love that it, it, it's a little bit warmer. It's a little bit more personal of a house, but there's also something that's a little bit off kilter about it. Like it feels attuned to the time. Like it doesn't feel out of place in that respect. But there's something about it that doesn't. It doesn't feel like asymmetrical. And there's something that like kind of adds to the heightened like uncomfortableness of it in a way that I don't know. It just uh, I just think it's all really smart art direction that I think highlights the themes of the show, but also just looks fantastic. And you know, just a lot of clear thought and time and effort put in. It goes into all these set locations, and obviously, I'm sure it's been pointed out and appreciated before. But I think it's worth pointing out as well. Absolutely. Okay, we cut to Pete. Breaking the news to his impossibly, suspiciously loving wife, Trudy. And, and, you know, we have to remember, they're still in the honeymoon phase for sure. But yeah, she is just like abnormally kind and sweet and loving with him. And he lies to her. He tells her, oh, you know, it didn't get brought up because, you know, my, you know, my father's having health problems. Yeah, okay. And she asks, what's wrong with him? And every time I watch this scene, I always like think he's going to say, his heart, right? That's what you would, that's what you, it's like where your mind goes, you know, it's just like, he's heartless, like all this stuff. But no, like this is, this is Mad Men, right? Uh, by the way, Lisa Albert uh, wrote this episode and no, he, he responds, nobody knows. And ah, like Vincent Kartizer in this whole scene, just, just, just right. It's like, he's trying so hard to make sure that the, sh the episode isn't playing on your sympathies. Like you're not, baselessly empathizing with Pete trying to get you to empathize with kind of a monstrous privileged bratty character is so difficult. And if he was sort of like overly vulnerable, it, I don't think it would come off as authentically as it does. Right. It's like him being kind of pathetic and sniveling and all of that only aids to, I think, you know, the intuitiveness of the character. So I really love that whole thing. Okay. So the next day we're at Sterling Cooper for as I mentioned before, a truly legendary pitch with uh, Bethlehem Steel. And it's been actually a while, uh, an episode or two, since we really saw like a full on pitch with Don. And, you know, he shows the ads. He's fully confident about them. Sal is smiling at the side. And, you know, like the, it's for Bethlehem Steel. And it's literally just like these posters of cities. And, you know, it's like New York City brought to you by Bethlehem Steel. 
And I totally agreed with Walt, the uh, account executive guy who, or not the account executive, but the, uh, the client who was just sort of like, they're kind of plain, aren't they? You know, he likens them to the WPA ads before the war. And then Don kind of just like, well, we could throw this artwork away in a minute. Uh, which of course, Sal is just like the heck. Um, yeah, I just Love think it's, Sal. It, <laughs> yeah, he's so good in this episode. Yeah, but like Don is so painfully old fashioned. Like, I think Walt rightfully points out that these feel like ads for cities. Like, I think he's right, you know. And like Pete clearly like can see that he's just sort of like no need to get cute, Don. And I think he actually does the right thing where he's sort of like, hey, you know, this is, the client has expressed himself. You know, gives him a day. And Don is kind of, I think, in the run here. Um, I mean, obviously Pete shouldn't be doing what he's doing. Like he's doing in the wrong way. He's flexing. He is kind of undermining and undercutting Don. That's obviously not what you do in this situation, but it is for, I think the right reasons. What do you guys think? I really like the power dynamics, right? Um, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I remember being early on in my career and just kind of being in those tough situations. Um, as you're trying to get your footing and being the younger guy, uh, and just, so not knowing how to interact with other people or in tough situations. And I think sometimes you just have to uh, kind of go pedal to the metal and go harder than you think you have to go to kind of get your foot in the door, get your name noticed. Um, and I think this is when you start see you start seeing Pete doing that. Um, so I recognize a lot of my younger self in, in that regard. Um, and obviously later in the episode, we you see the results of that, but um, I, I really like this scene just because I, I saw a lot of myself in Pete Campbell. Yeah, because he clearly, like, he doesn't want to just be, like, what his father has accused him of. Like, he doesn't, you know, Don, you know, Don stops him. There's that perfect, like, it's a gift these days, right? The whole meme of, like, Don stopping him at the door. And he's just, like, criticizing Pete for not doing his job, for, you know, not preparing the client properly. He he takes it out on Pete, even though it's not Pete's fault. It's It was just a bad pitch. And this is where I think that it comes in. That I think Don is distracted by the Rachel thing. I think that is brought up earlier in the episode to sort of be like he's off his game. And it kind of makes me wonder, too, if it's like if he's not having affairs, he doesn't have his mojo. But that, that's a whole that's a whole thing I'm going to keep bringing up because I, I want to get to the end of the season and see, like, does that really track for like as Weiner's like intention? Uh, well, I mean, I can certainly understand where Don is coming from in that, like, he doesn't feel like he did a bad job because he was doing what was expected of him. Like, yeah, that he was, was selling a bad idea. Well, well, no, but I mean, he said like they, he was very enthusiastic about the pitch before. I mean, we don't know for sure if he's lying or anything, but we have to assume uh, without any evidence to the contrary that he's telling the truth, that that's what the client liked before. But obviously, you know, like an idea can be better in theory than an execution. Right. But I mean, in, from his point of view, it's like, you know, like I, presented this thing and we agreed on it. We were excited about it. And this is why I delivered. And now you're not really digging it, which isn't the client's fault. Like, you know, you just, maybe it seemed better in uh, theory, like I said, but yeah, I mean, I think Pete is right to want to appeal to the client, but he's doing it for the wrong reasons. He's doing it for a personal gain rather than to make the client feel better about himself. And I think Don can obviously see through that and see through Pete Campbell as a person and obviously feels undermined because Pete Campbell is someone who just wants to jump through hoops to be respected. And obviously, I mean, we, we get a little bit more uh, understanding of as to why that is, but you know, at the same time, Pete is just a sniveling little guy who we can't ever really respect. And therefore none of his colleagues can respect him either. And there we are. Yeah, it all fits with his character. He grew up so privileged and entitled. He, you know, he doesn't feel like he's beholden to the rules, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That other people are that he can get away yeah. with sort of being that having that defiance. And uh, yeah, yeah the yeah. whole sorry, what? No, I was just gonna. I mean, well, I'll let you finish your thought. I was just gonna say this episode has the scene. I mean, has my favorite quote of the episode. But I was gonna. Say oh yeah, I was gonna come up. Yeah, so like Don is like leave the ideas to me, which obviously hits Pete because he's just like. I have ideas. I have good ideas. And I just love it where he's like, you know, I, I'm I sure you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's Sterling like, I Cooper, of... yeah, I, I pulled mm -hmm. it up to make sure I, he's like, I have idea. Pete Campbell says, I have ideas. And Don Draper says, I'm sure you do. Sterling Cooper has more failed artists and intellectuals than the third Reich, which is a fantastic line. Perfect line. And then Peter's just like, you know, I, I thought of like direct marketing. I thought of that. Turns out it already existed. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I arrived at it independently. Um, I literally have heard people say this, like in the advertising world, and it's truly embarrassing, maximum cringe. Um, he also has this brilliant cell phone where he's like, I come to this place and you, you like, you people tell me I'm good with people, which is strange because I've never heard that before. <laughs> And obviously he's trying to say, it's just like, I'm not, you know, I, I can be creative and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. All right. So that night, Helen rudely, like last minute, asked Betty to watch her kids. I was very much like, Helen, that is not neighborly. Come on. But no, she puts she puts Betty on the spot and she's kind of sure. like, oh, you know, can you do this thing? Like guilt trip, guilt trips her. And you well, know, I mean, you know. You know, John F. Kennedy's in town. You never know when you're gonna, the last time you're going to see him. Was so. he in town or she was just going to campaign headquarters to stuff on? She, was, just, the, she uh, was just stuff in Impolis because New York is so important, which, sure. by the way, it was. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. New York used to be purple. But uh, yeah, no, she uh, you know, she she wants the stuff envelopes for JFK. Rest in peace. And then Don gets to watch the kids. So Betty can go. Uh where are those scenes, by the way? I mean, we see Don kind of like on the couch, like doing the Bethlehem Steel stuff. He's obviously just, you know, he's Don. But I just, I wanted at least one scene. I've always wanted to see like, like one of the kids like look up and be like, dad, do you love us? And he'd just be like, it's toasted. You know, just something like that. I would have been happy. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, Don doesn't, Ryan, doesn't do anything mm -hmm. with those kids. Like he, no. it's a miracle they get into bed. You know, it's <laughs> like he, he does. He definitely also doesn't change them. Like if they were in their regular day clothes, like those kids are going to sleep in slacks. No, I mean that's the thing. He, they probably are just like, Dad, should we go to bed? He's just like, watch TV. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so Betty arrives at the Bishop household, and a night of true chaos begins. Uh, she wonders, you know, if there are going to be a lot of nice men at the JFK campaign you know thing probably hinting you know simultaneously like you know helen honey you need a man how are you going to function without a man because her house is a mess but also you kind of wonder it's like again i think betty just wants to be helen she's just like ooh, you know like i could be going out tonight i could be going to this place and meeting guys or whatever and uh you even kind of sense it when like her again her childishness when um, she's like, oh, do you know about JFK? And she's like, I'm not sure who we're, we're voting for. It's just like that lack of agency. Um, also, I did want to note that uh, confirmed in this episode that Helen Bishop is a liberal. Uh, she would have voted for Obama a third time if she could have. So elsewhere in the city, Pete is having dinner with Trudy's parents. And her dad is quite the jokester. He was making me laugh. Funny guy. She'd take the show on the road. Um, no, but Pete lies about, you know, Don not being his boss. So that's one thing that happens in a way, I guess he's sort of right based on what happens later in the show. Uh, but yeah, it's weird, you know, that I, I wanted to bring this up. Why does Trudy want to buy an apartment? Cause it's like, why doesn't she want a house? I know that like they work in the city, I guess, but yeah, she wants to be in the city. This. They're young. This is a hip and happening thing to do. They why don't, they don't have an kids. apartment. You're going to buy a house later. Cause Freddie's for suckers. They have money. You buy. I guess, That's, but they don't have money. That's the thing. They would be locking themselves into a mortgage. I don't know. Will, what do you think? You're a homeowner, right? I am not a homeowner, uh, not in the slightest. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I think Mike's on point. Like, I think she wants to be young and vibrant and in the city, enjoying her life. And I think she's someone who has lived a life where she has just gotten what she wanted you know, at mm -hmm. pretty much every corner. And she's at a point where she's like, I just want to have an apartment with my husband and enjoy life and be close to the city. And, you know, I mean, I think she's so obviously probably looking out for um, her husband being like, he's probably closer to work, you know, therefore she can, he can spend more time with me. He doesn't have to commute as much. That's the thing. It's like, I, that's why I would get renting. But yeah, I just, I guess I just don't understand putting roots down in a place that you know you're not going to live in forever. That's the thing that always kind of confused me about it. But I get what but, you guys uh, are saying. Yeah. I mean, but also, I don't know, like, is she at a point where she wants to have kids? Like, why else would she want a house? That's the thing. It's like, she doesn't want, I wouldn't think she would want a house now. Right. Also, like, that kind of implies that she does want to have kids at some point, but they would have a kid in the city probably. But okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, Trudy's mom. You know, like Trudy gets it from her mom in terms of wearing the pants uh, in this relationship and good on them. They need to uh, have you met these guys. And uh, yeah, when, you know, they ask about the down payment and everything, she kind of leads a discussion. Uh, I like the moment where Pete just like, 
sir. I, and he's like, huh, I'll take Tom or dad. And just like Pete's face when he's just like, Tom, <laughs> like just very, you know, doesn't want to uh, be there in that moment. And I have a question for you, Will. So the dad makes this whole comment where he's like, ah, you're going to be a rich bastard on your own someday. Well, make your prediction. Do you think Pete Campbell's going to be a rich bastard by the end of the show, by the end of the series? Uh, my guess would be no. So, Will, you're going to say no. I think his hubris will ultimately lead to his demise in some way or another. All right. Well, let's uh, let's keep that in motion. Okay. And then I think I think that's the last of it. I think one thing about this scene, um, and we'll cut to the car part, which I think is the real climax of this whole thing. But yeah, Tom clearly sees Pete as a surrogate son, and it's kind of sad because like Pete could get this like loving relationship from this Tom guy, you know, like as much as you can get from your in laws, and he just kind of rejects it, rejects it, right? And yeah, it, it's it's pretty sad. I thought I don't know if you guys had comments on that. Yeah, I mean, Pete's daddy's issues are just are just too deep, too um, numerous to count. It's and it's sad because it's literally they both they both want it right, but neither of them are going to get it. <laughs> well, they won't. They could. They should. They to quote Allison Brie. All right, so we cut to Pete and Trudy in the car, and Pete's not having it. He hates having supportive in laws and a loving wife who would move heaven and earth to start a life with him. Can you imagine? Can you blame him? What a nightmare! My question is, what does Pete Campbell want? You know, because I think the genius of the character is that he's often right for the wrong reasons and in the wrong ways. Like he is right to be so nervous about what it means for him to accept all this money for the apartment, right? To just be sort of skeptical, to be a little bit like, hey, I feel uncomfortable. I was like, what does this money mean? It's just the problem is that he's doing it in such a terrible way and he's belittling his wife in the process. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think Pete just wants to be successful, but by his own hand, um, he wants to be self-made. Um, but I think sometimes he forgets the the hard work that goes with it because he has grown up in privilege. So he's gotten things faster than he should have. So when that success doesn't come as easy or as quick as he wants, he starts uh, pushing on the gas too hard, does them in the wrong ways. Like he, like he mentioned. Um, and then it doesn't, doesn't lead to success. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just think Pete is a man of contradictions. He is someone like Mike said, who wants to be self-made, but he is also a man inherently of privilege. And he is someone who wants to be deemed as a peer or successful from the jump. Like even from his first day as Sterling Cooper, he wants to be idolized and respected on the same level as uh, Don Draper. And, you know, he is someone who, I think wants to be many things at once that often conflate and contradict with one another. And that would be my reason for guessing why his hubris, his hubris will lead to his downfall eventually. But I have no idea of knowing that if that will pay out. Well said, well said and well predicted. Okay. But they don't explain though, by the way, I was curious about this. So I even wrote it down. They don't explain like, cause, cause Trudy's sort of like, can we go up to park? Can we go up to the apartment? And I guess the implication is that they're just going to like drive past and be like, look at this apartment. I'm so excited about it. Um, but I mean, I guess nothing happens with that. I was curious, like, I remember, I think the first time I was watching this, I was like, oh, is she going to like try to like have sex with him or something in the apartment or do, but no, this is mad men. We're not watching like gossip girl. So, um, that was the whole thing, I guess. So we return to the, oh no, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I just thought it was fine. I, you thought they were about to have sex. I was surprised in that scene that he didn't hit her. Uh, that's where I thought <laughs> things were going to go. But maybe that's, uh, of that's uh, Sopranos whiner, not Mad Men whiner. He's a horrible person. Yeah. He, he is like, that's the thing. Pete Campbell, one of the things about the guy is that like, he's not, he's an emotional abuser, not a physical abuser. That's his, that's his whole deal, I think. Um, okay. So we return to the mean streets of Ossining. Betty and Glenn's hot play date. It's going pretty well. They're watching the real McCoys and things are getting real, if you know what I mean. Um, I mean, like... <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I like where you're going with this, John. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I don't think I like this description that you're painting here. I think you referred to this... Uh, you compared this to licorice pizza, Will. Hence, I'm eating licorice right now. Okay. I hope you don't mind. Um, you know, Glenn's in his PJs, you know fucking shooting his shot like some kind of giga chad um betty goes to the bathroom she's kind of like spying on helen's stuff because again she's obsessed and glenn opens the door to watch her because as will ashen described me in a private described to me in a private text message several hours ago glenn bishop is a quote freak on main is that a 
Is, am I quoting you accurately there? Freak on the main, I think. Freak on the main. Said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like, again, it's like, I guess you can just say she's jealous. Um, Betty has a psychological profile of a child. We all know all that stuff. She scolds Glenn, but it's like she has no authority. Right. She's like scolding him like she's 10. Um, and I think it only makes Glenn kind of feel bolder. Right. And by the side note, I cannot believe Matthew Weiner is letting this is his kid as Glenn. I can't believe he let his kid do that. Right. Well, I did not know that. that, you didn't know is... that? I thought we mentioned it in no. the last episode. Uh, maybe you did. And I forgot. We I mean, it has been a few days since we recorded that episode, to be clear. Um, <laughs> that's like uh, when George Lucas hired his kid to be in Revenge of the Sith. To be like that one kid Jedi that dies like yeah. <laughs> immediately. Like yeah. he like swings his lightsaber a few times and like just gets shot. Like that's that's on par. I would take that not- over this where it's just like, all right, like Matthew Weiner sitting down with this kid. He was like, here's the scene. Mm-hmm. And I guess like somebody else wrote this, but still. Well, no, it's uh, I was reading. It's based on Matt. Like that specific scene was based on something that literally happened. To Matthew Weiner as a kid where he had a crush on an adult. And he went into the bathroom to see her because he had a crush on her. And that's exactly how he described it to him. Did he also Jeez. go for the hair? I remember I you talked I, about. I don't know about the hair. That's. Uh, I know. I know you're right because I have heard about this interview before. I think it was on uh, one of those behind the curtain videos. Uh, yeah, man, that's. I like. Uh, I like imagining. Uh, Matthew Weiner pitching this to his writer's room as if this is like a normal thing that people do. It's just like, so I just want to have like a kind of relatable scene where, you know, like where you're, you're with your babysitter and then you like spy on her when she's in the bathroom. Right. Like that's like something we've all experienced at 10. Right. Yeah. He's and like his, looking you know, around finger pointing. Yeah. But also the, the babysitter, the, the, she's going to have about nine layers of clothes on. Right. And she's going to sit like she is like nine years old. Yeah. Um, like the way she's sitting down and everything. Yeah, and, and he's a boss. So you can't be like Matthew. What are you talking about? You're gonna be like, up, oh, uh, sure, yeah. What I mean, are you talking about? Uh, right. But guys, what's what's worse, asking for the hair or Betty giving him the hair? <laughs> Betty giving him the hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's no worse. question. <laughs> so what happens is, so Glenn apologizes after he's been told he has to, and I bet he likes being told what to do. I'm sorry, I keep coming. <laughs> um, he goes in for the hug because the dude knows what he's doing, shooting a shot to get a chat like we established. He's like, you're pretty. <laughs> like, like, well, thank you, dear. Really pretty. How old are you? <laughs> like, it's just so like, you can tell like Betty's getting flattered. It's so gross. And, he's, and she's like, well, I'm the same age as your mother. And he's just like, well, my mom's 32. And she's like, I'm 28. And again, she's just like, ah, I'm 28. Uh, same age as Will Ashton. She says that. Uh, That's true. Show. Yeah, I thought that was an odd choice. Uh, considering that when the, this episode aired, I would have been, uh, what was this 2007? So I guess it would have been like 12 or 13. Um, mm-hmm. so I thought that was a cre- incredibly a bizarre choice, but, uh, nonetheless, I, I think it was fitting for me on this re or this, yeah, yeah. this rewatch. Great timing. I, miraculous in a way. Um, but he's just like, your hair is so beautiful. You know, you look like a princess, all this stuff. And, you know, he asked the question, all of us are expecting at this point because he's been, you know, sufficiently creepy enough to ask can I have some? Can I have some of your hair? Just a little piece. You won't even miss it. And just Betty does it. She gives him some of her hair. Why does she do this? Like, what? she goes to the couch and like, she has that look on her face. She's just like, somebody likes me. Like what is happening? It's so weird. Yeah. It just this makes show. you feel gross. It just makes you feel weird. Ugh. I mean, one thing I did find fascinating is I feel like this scene, as uncomfortable as it is, is complex and fascinating and it really gives you some intriguing insight into Betty as a character. But you know if this was even pitched in 2022, it would get rejected, I think, off the table immediately. Like They'd be like, uh, it's kind yes. of weird and interesting, but we're not doing that. Like, Come up with another idea. <laughs> Or something, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're not getting everybody literally on Twitter. Yeah, on I would our, say the, backs for this. the woke heroes on Twitter would have really had a fun time with this one. You mm-hmm. think licorice pizza was bad? <laughs> for the love of God, don't show these people Lolita. Ah, Glenn Bishop, we're gonna we're gonna see him again. Will I think you know that, right? Uh, no, I did not know that. 
No, he does show up later in the season. I think you said you saw him the whole season, right? I mean, yes, but it's been you don't remember. a decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't remember him. Fair enough. Little tease. He's coming back. Don't worry. You'll get to see him again. All right, so we cut to a lounge. I think they call it the St. Regis, where the Bethlehem Steel dude, Walt, is being handled by Ken, Crog- Ken Cosgrove. He's kind of babysitting him. Pete comes by, brings over some ladies, kind of backing up his father's whole, like, you're whoring around. It's like, yep. That's true. And uh, he's got that Campbell gift of being correct. Uh, unfortunately correct. Uh, Pete pitches Walter one of his ideas. And it's it's better than... I think it's better than Don's. Like, it's still not good. What do you know it's... about marketing? <laughs> but no, it's just like... It's, it's more... Ca- it's like catchier. It's a little bit more of like... Correct to the market. You know? Like, I don't think it's artistic or anything. But like, it's I mean, a steel commodity. What are you going to do? It is a catchier tagline. Like we it's should understandable say the Bethlehem why. Steel, the backbone of America. Yeah, I mean that is a catchier, more memorable uh, tagline than whatever. Like, oh, child of Bethlehem, whatever. Uh, a Dante little town of Bethlehem, which is a thinker. It's like you know from it's the clever. acorn, from the yeah. You know. It's clever, but like it's not commercial. You know. I don't know. It could be commercial everything for the sixties. Every- People know about that more than I would say. It's a better reference back then than it is now. Sure. Still, I I, I agree with Will though, like broadly, because I think back when of America, I think of car companies. I think of Toyota, Ford, all that stuff. But okay, I did want to bring up that one line this guy has, where he's talking to that woman, and it's super creepy. Where he's just like, "I would have thought you slept all day and bathed in milk." Gross, creepy men. What are you gonna do? But I guess I guess the whole thing with that is just sort of again reestablishing what Pete is doing, like how embarrassed he is by the job and everything. That was my basic read. It's like, of course we're gonna do this. Um, but also that was more of a, that was another agree, just like it's the sixties, you know, men are stinkers, like that whole thing. All right. So back at the Bishop House. Helen arrives with her Kennedy literature, as she promised. She is unaware that her son has just had a sexual awakening. I think he's unaware, too, to an extent. And we quickly cut to Betty getting into bed with Don. And he's looking over his ad, his ad which we see at that point, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem. And then it kind of like transitions in the nice little super cut into the ad they pitched to Walter the next day. One cool little tidbit I found about it this episode when I was doing some research was that like you imagine like, oh yeah, that's, they didn't have time to do full like ads or whatever. They're like sketches. And they actually had ad consultants on the show who made sure it's like, Hey, like this is about the extent of what he would have been able to do like on such short notice. So I thought that was a nice touch. And, you know, Walter looks at him. He's just like, they look pretty familiar. <laughs> I'm like, he's right. You know, it's just like, they barely changed the idea and he, you know, Don's trying, he's being like, oh, you know, we wanted to keep to the basic strategy, but he just refuses to sort of like move on from the idea. And it speaks a lot, of course, to Don just, yeah, uh, I think he's in a bit of a funk. I mean, his ego has been hurt. His pride's been hurt. And I feel like that's why he's not really looking straight. And I think that leads to what happens a little bit later in the scene. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I, I don't really side with Pete because he is undermining his boss and acting insubordinate and did something, that was, you know, uh, detrimental to the overall client's goal, even if he feels like he's trying to help him. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I, I think Don is going to have to take the L for this one, unfortunately. Pete outcopied him. It's such a bold move. You is that you bring up this show where it's like about a tortured philanderer genius. And then the sniveling villain of the show comes in with a better idea. And it's and it's, it's still not a good idea, but it's better. And I don't know. I mean, I guess, do you, did you agree with that, Mike? I know Mike, Will and I think are on that page. What about you? Oh, man. No, I... You uh, like Bethlehem. I, yeah, I like Bethlehem, baby. Well, it's because here's the thing. It's that Don, like, he was right when they were leaving the last meeting, right? He was sentenced away for having this guy convinced. Uh, and so, like, what is, like, I guess, success in the profession? Is it, uh, you know, getting them to say yes to your idea that your company's already worked on, that you've already convinced them of? Uh, or is it to scrap your idea, restart, have everybody work again just to make the client a little bit happier? 
But at the end of the day, he probably would have been happy if he got convinced by Don. Uh, so all this to say, I think that's also experience versus uh, just uh, Don is trying to do what's right for the company. He's trying to get the client just to like the idea. Everything is going to work. Pete just wants his idea to be picked. Pete just wants what he wants best for himself. So obviously yes. I, I put myself on Don's side. And, you know, Don at the same time, he wants his idea to be the one that wins over what's better for the company. Right. So I think, yeah, it's a little bit of both a little bit, I think. And it's so funny because like if these two guys put their heads together, <laughs> you know, I think one thing about Pete that is admirable is that he is willing to stand up to Don and he is willing to sort of like speak his mind and sort of be like, this is what I think. And I think the problem is that a lot of the people that report to Don or write for Don don't stand up to him. They're afraid of him. And Don doesn't see that a guy like Pete Campbell is an asset because Don is just so closed minded. His ego, as we've mentioned, kind of prohibits him from being open to the idea of Pete being an asset in that way. It's like, leave the ideas to me. And I think that I get where Don is coming from because I would probably be, I would behave the same way. You know, I think a lot of us would. It's, it's interesting to say that, though, because obviously we won't get into it, won't give specific spoilers, but we see later in the show as somebody who people don't want to give a lot of attention to, Don is pretty on board with and okay with. Hey, character growth, man. Uh, but we'll get to that, sure. Um, so the, the, pit, the backbone idea gets brought up, um, and then Pete kind of has a smug look on his face, you know, that the client likes that better. He's like, oh yeah, the, the, you know, Pete pitched it to me. Like, frankly, I, I'm, I like that, you know, you liked it so much, you know, that you couldn't wait to, to tell me about it. So, you know, clearly he's giving Don the credit and then, you know, the, the client leaves and then Don is just sort of like, you know, enjoy it, you know, like this, this moment he's being sarcastic and Pete's just like, I think, I think, you, you know, I did a good thing and you got the compliment for it. And Don, who is, um, a hundred percent over it fires his ass. And it's like, it, it's cathartic in a way because like the way he does it, it's just like, I don't know if you guys have ever fired somebody. I've never fired somebody. If I did, I would wish that it was like this visceral. I, that's pretty bad, isn't it? I should not be thinking that, but I did. I was just sort of like, I need you to get a cardboard box and put your things in it. Like, it's just <clears throat> the only thing about this whole thing and I'll let you guys get into it, but Sal is pretty cruel about it. Come on, Sal. Like Sal's just like, you picked a bad time to buy an apartment. Sal, be nice. You're a coworker. Come on. I no, I think when Sal is super sassy, it's always my favorite. He just, <laughs> I mean, he, I get it. From, yeah. The entertainment value of it is good. Yeah. He's just, you know, he's a, a sassy little mofo and he just wants, you know, it's that, uh, he relish, he's a bad, you know what? And he loves for he lives for drama. Hell yeah! It's that straight man sass, right? Because he's straight. <laughs> yeah, he said he was straight. So. He talks about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, he's always checking out the ladies. Um. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, I have fired someone before, and uh, it was the exact opposite. I just felt bad the entire time. Because you're a, oh, because Mike, you're a good person. I mean. You know, so you don't you don't delight in like yeah making people unhappy yeah. It's funny you guys are saying that all the time. I'm a good person, but I've never heard that before. Um, <laughs> I was gonna ask hired. you guys one thing about this firing, and that's uh, did Don have the authority to actually do that? Like, no. Okay. I Obviously, think so. he should have. Like, if he actually wanted to fire him, he'd have to go up the ladder, right? You'd have to like talk to um, Sterling, and then also like. But it, it speaks it speaks that. to the power that Don has in the company, though, where he can make that decision and he feels confident that he's going to go to Sterling and Cooper and be like, this is happening. And they're going to be like, yep, he's fired. Which it basically was. They were both right. shocked when he got shot mm -hmm. down. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Pete is clearly shaken. Sorry, this is like Richard so good. Pete is clearly shaken. He goes to his office. He orders everyone out, throws the Bob Newhart album out onto the floor. It's pretty great. Um, I did find it kind of weird. That they're just like hanging out in his office. Boundaries, guys. Freaking weirdos. Uh, Hildy literally just like well, doesn't he, even... Go ahead. He has a record player in his office. I know, I know. I don't know yeah. why they're in there still. It's like, it's not your office, dude. But uh, okay, whatever. Um, they're friends. And then uh, Hildy, she kind of sees the record like fly out, right? And I love how she just 
she barely moves an inch. Hildy is probably the best secretary in the entire show. Maybe second only to one who comes up in like the sixth season or no fifth season. Excuse me. Um, Secretariat. Yeah. The horse. Um, I can't believe, I can't believe that just happened. Uh, but yeah, no, Hildy is a queen. Uh, we stand for her. Um, then we go to Roger Sterling. Finally, there is not enough Roger Sterling in this episode, but we are going to get more Roger, uh, in an episode or two. I'm excited. I cannot wait for the big Roger episode. Uh, but yeah, Don storms into his office. He's emotional. He's just like, remember Pete Campbell's last day. He's a bit insolent, you know, it's today. And it's like, okay, clever Don. Again, I, I, he's like not clever in this episode, you know, like, Oh, boo, that's Pete good. That's good. Today? That's no, clever. It's not. That's yes, clean. it is. No. Last episode, he was so much. Uh, he was so much more like biting. Last episode, like ah, uh, he did so much more with so much less. But anyway, that's my take. That's my take. Um, again, like I said before, I think he's more creative when he's like either in an affair or building out to an affair. But that's whatever. Um, he did something pretty bad in the advertising world. You know, I've worked in advertising. I know. Mike, you've kind of been adjacent to the advertising world, haven't you? You worked for startups, like you kind of know. My thing is that, like, if if somebody at the equivalent of an account executive did something like that, like pitched copy, I don't think they'd get fired. You know, if it was like a first offense, I do think it's it's what we would call a career limiting move. It's something that gives you a reputation that you have to like eat a lot of crow to like get over because it, it is like a super terrible move. Like you just don't do it. There are clear boundaries, uh, but. That's my take. Like, obviously, I I have my own experiences. It could be totally different. People could be listening to this and be like, "John, you're wrong." You know, like I've seen people get fired for way less. All that. Yeah, I think in certain industries, it's like there are these those like unspoken rules, unwritten rules, or even you know they are spoken and it's you know very well known. Um, obviously, this day and age, you have a lot more leeway to do these types of things, but uh, definitely not back then. Hmm. Society was way more hierarchical yeah. back then. It still is, but yeah. I mean, like I said, I think it's less that... I think it is a fireable offense. It's just the fact that Don did it uh, in the moment rather than consulted any of his higher-ups. I feel he like did it's it in the, the moment. Sure, that's true. You said Don, yeah. No, no. I mean, Don fired Pete in the moment. Like, it wasn't like something he, like, thought of and it was just like, oh, yeah, like, you know time to fire pete is just like he wanted to have the higher up on pete in that moment it's like you know what sure You're yeah fired. but i guess i'm referring to how roger was just sort of like that little shit uh, but yeah that's oh fair. yeah 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 but yeah, like sure. clearly pete believed that don had the authority to do that he went and oh sure. started pissing his it's pants and move. crying yeah well that's what i'm trying to say is it was a power move and like clearly mm. it was like don trying to like assert power over pete who was rather successfully dominating um, yes. Don in this episode and then with this um, uh, assignment. But yeah, I mean, I just like the, the yeah, I mean, it wasn't going to end well for Don because he was asserting power. But the fact that it got as far as it did uh, is a credit to Don's uh, influence and his like ability in the office. But then can we, we but can, can we please get to uh, the conversation with Madman's version of Yoda? <laughs> Well, no, because we have to cut to Betty with her okay. therapist for a very revealing session. I know. Uh, you got to eat your vegetables. I, I, I checked out of this scene just like I'm going to check out of this conversation. Fair, fair. But uh, no, we have to cut to Betty. She's with her therapist. And, you know, she tries to say that she pities Helen's life, Helen Bishop's life. There's something to be said about how Hel- how Betty, I even said Helen, Betty is in with a therapist and she's supposed to be talking about herself. She's spending the entire time talking about a divorced woman who lives down the street. It is kind of fascinating well, to me. Not just her, but Glenn, which I mean, if all that stuff happened, I would probably dominate a <laughs> therapist point being like, I met this really weird kid. And <laughs> but no, like, she doesn't. She, she does it veiled. Right. So again, I mean, I think, I think what she wants is that freedom and the independence that Helen has. She sees Helen as somebody who is her own person, who supports herself, takes care of herself. It's like she's trying to harp on all the things that Helen doesn't have of like, well, you're not, your life isn't as good as mine, but of course, I think the clear implica- implication or you know, inference you're supposed to make is that Betty wishes that she was Helen, that Helen is happy and she can't believe 
that Helen gets to be happy and she doesn't because she did everything right. And you see it, you hear it when Betty is like, honestly, I think she's jealous of me. I've seen it before. I was in a sorority. It's like such a deflection. It's such projection. That's like, no, honey, she is not jealous of you. Helen does not like Helen would look, it looks at her life and it's just like, Helen is the one who pities Betty and rightfully so I think. And then, yeah, there's a moment where she's like, you know, talking about Glenn, like you said, Will, and she's like, the person taking care of him isn't giving him what he needs. And then, like, yeah, you get some uh, To Catch a Predator vibes at that point. Mike anyway. Mike just wants to get right to Burt Cooper. He doesn't even, he's like, hurry up. Okay. Just so tired of Betty and her fucking problems. My God, I feel like Don. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly. You were to say, Will? No, I just was going to say, I think it's time to go. Meet the Colonel. It's time. Back at Sterling Cooper, Don and Roger. Phil, Bo- Co- Phil Burt Cooper in on what happened. But he surprisingly pushes back. Because they're just, you know, Roger's is sort of like, you know, there are rules. Mm-hmm. And Bert, uh, he begins, I think, a really fine scene where he's like, there are other rules. You know, he's such an such a great character. One of my favorite characters in the whole show. Sec, you know, oh, there are rules Roger there Sterling. are. <laughs> yeah, I like that Mike calls him Yoda. I call him the Colonel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I John just shows Bert. more respects. He's yeah. iconic. He's Bert Cooper. He's Robert Morris. Put some respect in the name. Um, but he Ooh, I gotta say, uh, Robert Morris still alive, still kicking, ninety years yeah. old. And I hope I don't jinx it by saying that. But I mean, yeah, well, I'm a yeah, little I, nervous. You said that. Yeah, here. I mean, but you know, that guy was you know working back in like the sixties and all that. And I think he's the only cast member, at least at this point, who you know was working during the time the show takes place, which is kind of a fascinating. Oh my gosh. That could be, that could be I true. just got breaking news on Twitter. What's mm-hmm. up? Robert Morse is oh. dead. Oh geez. That'd be my, that'd you do know sad. these episodes are staggered. So it's like, <laughs> exactly. Cool I just have to fire. kill Robert Morris before this goes live. <laughs> oh my it's going to be live for um, the listener. No, I'm I'm moving on. Um, no, but he he explains that New York City is a marvelous machine. You know, theme of the episode, right? It's called New Amsterdam. You know, obviously a direct reference to New York. We had all the stuff with Bethlehem Steel. We have all the stuff about Pete. You know, getting his apartment and trying to like make something of himself in New York City. We've been talking about it this whole time. You know, he I love how he describes New York as a fine watch wound tight always ticking you know and obviously roger and don are just like okay so and he's like well look pete's mother is a dykeman and they own pretty much everything north of 125th street a fair chunk of the island you know that whole thing um by the way nice little you know sort of callback to the whole like everything falls off after 83rd and park obviously yeah uh the dykeman's uh also uh, the Ro- uh i almost said robert morris but uh bert references how the dykeman's lost it all uh, during, you know, in the 1919 or 1929 stock market crash. There you go. And, uh, yeah, his concern is super valid. He's just like, he doesn't want, you know, hit Dorothy Dykeman Campbell, uh, talking badly about Sterling Cooper because they fired her son. And he's like, we lose him, we lose our entree to the blah, 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 blah. I don't remember any of them, but yeah, you get it. Um, And, you know, Don takes it pretty personally. You know, he's just like, yeah, what I'm hearing is that Pete is more valuable to the agency than I am. Um, Bert's like, there's a Pete Campbell at every agency. He's like, well, you know, can we get one of those? And uh, Bert gives Don some real advice. He's like, you're going to need a stronger stomach to see how the sausage is made. Like, I love, like, even how his head, like, tilts up as he says it. It's fantastic. This is one of the moments when I first watched it on the rewatch but like makes me love Mad Men so much. Like it's such a good show that, you know, midway through the show, we get this really great line of, you know, we did give you everything. We gave you your name. What are you going to do with it? And, 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 and to bring that back at the end of the episode here and to see his ass only get saved because of his name. Yep. Oh my God. It's just, it's and he doesn't so even good. Know it. And he doesn't even know it. Oh, it's so good. It's Mad Men. Man. It's Mad Mad Man. It's a Mad Mad Men podcast. It's a Mad 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 Men podcast. 
<laughs> but yeah. Um, what are your thoughts, Will? I mean, you're obviously watching this slightly fresher than us. Uh, yeah, but I mean, like I said before, I remember if I were to recollect the first season before we did this podcast and this rewatch, there would probably be like three or four scenes that would come to mind from that previous watch. And this is one of them. Like, I just remember the scene very vividly. And it's for a lot of the reasons that I think Mike brought up just as far as like the way that it's written, the way that it plays with expectations, the way that uh, Robert Morris's performance really leans into that suspense in a way that doesn't feel like he's playing his hand too much. Uh, it's just a really well executed scene. Like I said before, I also just love how bizarre the set is too. That there are all these little quirks, but they don't feel like overladen to the um, show or the characters. They just kind of add to the the heightened absurdity that is uh, Burt Cooper's character. They also reestablish but, you know, like why Sterling is so deferent to him by showing the picture of literally Burt having Roger on his knee. Yeah, in a way, that, yeah, it, it like undermines him immediately. You know, mm -hmm. like it's like you, you see. Uh, Sterling is this kind of like sly silver fox of a guy. But then in that moment, you know, this infotizing, you know, we, we see uh, um, Pete being, uh, you know, brought down to like a child level throughout this episode. We see obviously Betty brought down to a child level throughout. And now we see Sterling brought down to a yeah. child level, you know, to the point where like they, they both and I guess Don because they have to take their shoes off. So subsequently they're smaller. I guess and by you learn that design. Roger's wearing lifts too, right? Or at least Don noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, and he obviously like they are different, you know, the moment they take their shoes off before they go into the office. Yeah. It all connects. And it's amazing because like, we know at this point that Don is someone whose name gave him nothing, right? Like he gave himself a name. We still don't know the truth behind why did somebody just call him Dick Whitman, but it's something to keep in mind for those of you who are rewatching the show. And then, you know, I, I don't know how much Do uh, Will remembers, but yeah, I mean, Don, he's the complete opposite of Pete Campbell in some ways where he has to swallow that Pete is getting by on the exact lack of meritocracy. It's a real pain point for him. So you, you can imagine how grinded up inside he feels when Bert is just like, I'm glad we're all better now. You know, that whole thing. Um, gotta love Burt Cooper. But then, yes, Don and Roger, they confront Pete. And Roger does it in a way that clearly doesn't go super well with Don. Like, Don in this frame, uh, for the first time, is the smallest person. He's in the background of the shot. And Pete and Roger sort of are, our, they're on like equal footing at that point. And Don is the one who's feeling like, I don't have any power. I'm the small man right now because now Roger is lying and saying that like the reason Pete still has his job is because Don stuck up for him and that he fought for Pete and all this stuff. You're here because of Don Draper's largesse. Great line. And Don clearly doesn't like it because of course he doesn't, you know, it, like I think like when you first watch the show, maybe you're sort of being like, Oh, you know, Don's kind of like getting it out, right? He's able to sort of like keep his ego and everything. But I think it's still, upsets the the entire like uh philosophy that don has about like working hard and being a creative person and he just sees what's happening it, like it just shakes him to his core right uh ugh, such a good scene yeah because it's like a, a certain level it's like god damn this kid's gonna think i believe in him now and i do not <laughs> yeah it's like give the kid a second and, chance and i mean i, I imagine this is the point where it's like Don will truly never respect Pete because Don as hard as we'll learn later, I guess, or we kind of know already is by definition, a self-made man. Like he made Don Draper literally like Don Draper is a man that he has created and like all of his success is owed to him, you know, using his wits and his skills in advertising. And Pete is someone who, you know, has been coasting as this episode is noted on his name and the power that that name has. And so ultimately, but also they will never does have good equals. ideas. <laughs> Sorry. Right. But at the same, yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's like a classic, like nepotism thing where it's yeah, like, exactly. It's not like Pete has like, it, it's not lacking in talent or anything, but just the fact that Pete will always be in the room because of who he is rather than right. what he's contributing to the table. And that's just the antithesis of who Don Draper is as a person. We go to Roger's office next. 
And again, you can tell that Don's annoyed, you know, and he even pricks a little bit at Roger, you know, pokes at him a little bit, who at this point in the show, they've been buddies. They've been like totally unassailable. They have this weird conversation. You know, we alluded to it at the beginning. We're going to end with it now. He's like, you don't know how to drink your whole generation, my generation. We drink because it's good. And I just think that, uh, again, I say this many times and I will always say it. John Slattery is one of the main draws of the show. I think he's a foundational, iconic staple of Mad Men. If I had to pick one character to go through all of their quotes and all of their moments, Roger Sterling is the one that I would pick. And that said, despite all of his charm and charisma, Don kind of looks at him and he's like, maybe I'm not as comfortable being powerless as you are. I love this moment because then Roger kind of like looks back and is like, pardon? You know, because then you get reminded there is power dynamic here. There is something between Don and Roger that is not been, it's not going to be resolved in this episode, but it's coming and it's going to be, I think, glorious. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think what's fascinating and revealing about this whole moment is that Don is clearly pushing the boundaries in the same way that Pete was. You know, I said before, it's like he's like the opposite of Pete Campbell, but at the same time, they're not that different, aren't they? Like that same initiative, that same sort of like creative drive to sort of defy their boss. Pete has that, and so does Dom. It's one thing they do have in common, and it's really telling that the next moment, the way that Roger deflects instead of stirring up shit with Don is being like, you shouldn't compete with Pete Campbell, not on a personal level, but for the world. I think it's brilliant. Uh, Fantastic stuff. Um, Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd want to really contribute besides that is I just think the scene looks fantastic from a cinematography standpoint. Mm -hmm. And from a lighting standpoint as well, I just think that, you know, I mean, I get why most shows nowadays aren't shot on 35 millimeter, but I just feel like the scene and also, I mean, one that we kind of glossed over that I think looks gorgeous, the uh, the car ride between uh, Trudy and Pete. I yeah. think that's also a really nice looking scene. I also really like how the visuals lend to that scene where like the light is reflecting off of uh, Trudy's face, kind of highlighting her optimism, her bright demeanor and like uh pete is kind of cloaked in the shadows a bit showing his like kind of moody shadow demeanor you know just like stuff like that just i I think that's why i really uh get drawn to with mad men you know i i I bring up a lot of the aesthetic stuff um but i think you know the aesthetics are really good so that's why i like to highlight them but um yeah i like yeah i just i think yeah i like the shot where we see betty pete okay i'm with glenn but i don't Sorry, I glossed over the part, by the way, where Roger's like, oh no, Don is the one where he's ref- he's remarking on uh, when Roger is just like talking about, we drink because it's good. And he mentions like the shaky hands thing. Uh, mm-hmm. It was a thing with his generation. And then I thought it was interesting. I was like, oh, like your wife? Oh. <laughs> but I, don't, I mean, just like, uh, I just wanted to, to highlight how good this, I just love like yes. Don being reflected off of, um, it's an after hours Sterling's conversation. Glass. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of things in the shot or the scene. I mean, uh, that I really like, and also I just feel like it highlights that, you know, these two actors, John ham and, uh, John Saturday, like they feel like they're born of a different time in that they just kind of look the part. And I feel yep. like having these two actors in the scene together, just like, man, I am transported. It's a it's a battle of wits, you know, it's a battle of ideologies. Roger is just trying to get to Don's head and be like, enjoy yourself. You're taking life too seriously. You're striving for something you don't need to. And Don clearly wants more than that. And it's like that rift between them. It's not enough to break the friendship, but it's certainly enough to sort of establish that like they're never going to be best friends. They'll always be work friends. It's a, it's a very ah, it's a very illuminating scene, yeah. Sure, and it makes you wonder like was there a moment in uh, um, uh, Sterling Cooper's life where he saw in Don what Don sees in You mean Pete? Roger Sterling? You said Sterling Cooper. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, Roger Sterling, I meant to say. Mm. Like, it makes you wonder, like, was there a point where, like, Sterling, like, looked down upon Don and just eventually he saw him as equal? Like, mm. was there, like, that, that kind of thing, you know, like, where, like, they had the kind of similarly, like, uh, Put a pin on that, Will. <laughs> there was only more episodes to explore the relationship. Yeah. They find they do understand at some point that Roger Sterling is important. Uh, and it's so remarkable, too, that he wasn't going to be in more than a season of the show. 
And I think this is one of those episodes too, where they, they were like, man, even when we have just a little bit of Roger, he brings the show to life. So uh, I am certainly happy that they kept him in the show and obviously made him such a big part of it. Well, Winder had to see him play Howard Stark. I was like, okay, we got to get this guy on board. True. True. Yeah. Uh, I think that was like 2010. So I think we were like a few seasons in, but sure. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you, you know, they, they mentioned this whole thing about like kids have no one to look up to because they look up to us. And I think this is where the core theme of the episode comes in, you know, from Glenn's father, you know, and to Pete's two fathers, right? You know, his father-in-law and his actual father to Don's father figures. I think Don's father figures in this are Roger and Bert. I think the implication is that the father-son dynamic is integral to the legacy of New York to some extent. And that's clearly changing in the 1960s because you see at the end of the episode when Pete is at the apartment and he looks on at Trudy and her mother and the female co-op board member, they're clearly in control of the apartment. They have the power. And it's such a remark, it's a shift of like where these like powers lie, right? Because like throughout this whole episode and it sneaks up on you, Pete's fortunes, like we said, his job being saved, it's owed to his mom, not Pete Campbell. Um, he even mentioned, he's just like, oh, it's different if I get it from my family because it's my money. It's his mother, right? Um, the money, the money's not from her, it's his mother to be clear. But yeah, I mean, Trudy even mentions like that story where she's just like, oh, you know, you mentioned the thing with your great, great aunt, you know, it was like, you know, beat up this guy or whatever. I don't even remember. But yeah, we see how Pete is having a moment of understanding too, where he is starting to like wake up to the actual gender dynamics at play and it's shaking him. And I think it's only fitting that the song at the end, uh, it's sung by a woman. And, you know, I, I think it's a really, yeah, it's a really, it's a really good moment because I think that it, it crystallizes and brings the entire story together. And I think that's why this is like, an A tier episode of Manhattan. Sorry, I meant Mad Men. We'll have Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island too. The backbone of America. Yeah. Not even, not even in the top half of uh, IMDb ratings for the first season, though. Interesting enough. I wonder why that is. That's interesting. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, um, great episode, guys. Great episode of Mad Men. Um, I already kind of mentioned the short story thing, uh, which I brought up a lot. But uh, any last thoughts before we move on and say goodbye for now? Where was, uh, where was, uh, what's her face? Why can't I cannot think of Christina Hendricks? Not Christina Hendricks. Yeah, Christina, Joan, where's Joan? Joan Holloway. Yeah. On this episode, she and Peggy were just kind of off. They had their own little misadventure, I guess. Yeah, it's like, you know, what are they doing? Are they like growing a baby or something? I don't know. <laughs> growing a baby. Okay. Will, you're at a loss for words? No, I'm just tired. Me I'm too, ready man. to wrap this episode up. I don't know what good Mike place is talking it. about. So I'm I'm just, yeah, I'm ready to wrap this up. Mad Men, what are you going to do? It's All Thursday. Right. Just, I'll leave you with this. Pete, Sal, Ken. Mary, kill fuck. <laughs> Mary, so, all, all right, So Let's just do wait, a whole so, open relationship, through the four of us. I want it. Pete, Sal, and who? Uh, Ken Cosgrove. Okay, Ken. You're gonna have to remind me. I, I think you get Ken Ken's a tall, lanky somebody. one. He's the one that was just briefly with the CEO at the St. Regis on this episode. I'm gonna say, marry Ken Cosgrove, kill Ken Cosgrove, fuck Ken Cosgrove. In that order, oh. huh? That's super fucking creepy. <laughs> you and Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, can I have um, some of your hair? <laughs> You're like a princess. Uh, I'm going to say kill Ken. Because I'm pretty indifferent to him. Uh, you kill people you're Pete. indifferent to? Okay. Well, let me explain. I mean, well, if, if it's a scenario where I have to kill one of these men, fuck one of these men, and marry one of them, like, I, I got to kill Ken because I'm indifferent to him and i don't think he's gonna he's gonna be a good lay if i'm gonna be perfectly honest why can't we play pete, smash or pony pass? but pete i mean let's be real like he is you know he seems like he's at least a memorable lay i feel like he's probably pretty good in bed he has that energy i don't That's know petty. maybe he's a giving lover 
Like, yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. No, like, maybe he's a like, giving love. Pete, Pete does not go down on women. He's too much of a misogynist. Maybe later, but not right now. I dis- we don't know. I disagree. I th- I think he probably does it and doesn't speak of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe, it's, maybe that's yeah, why Niagara a, Falls was so wet. Okay. <laughs> he's a real, like, yeah, uncle. I, I, get, I get some real Uncle Junior vibes from Pete. Sure. I would not so, marry Sal, though. Sal is too sassy. Sal, I would He's absolutely too mean. marry Sal. He's so what? funny. I'd marry, fun. I'd marry Pete just for the money. <laughs> See, if I'm going to marry somebody for money, it's going to be it's going to be Ken Cosgrove. But I, that's because I know things that happen later. True. Not money, oh, so you guys later. know more about Ken than I do at this mm. point. So maybe my opinion will change. Ken doesn't I really don't have, have real money. But let's yeah. just say he changes his last name from Cosgrove to Cosmo. Nice. Okay. You ever heard of Cosmo Lashin? Sure. He's the inventor of Sex in the City. Wow. There you go. All right, All right. That's it for us this week. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll be back for the next episode of Mad Men Men. Um, the episode five of the show. We'll get to it. Um, see y'all later. Bye.